I work in the lab of Pascal Cossart. So we are interested in the interaction of listeria with target cells. And today I will speak to you about two stories. One story first that we published not so long ago, which uh, illustrates how listeria manipulates several signaling cascades in the cell, and in particular how it manipulates the phosphinocytide metabolism in cells in order to induce entry. And then another story which we are trying to publish at this moment, and which uh, illustrates how Listeria manipulates members of the tetraspanin family in order also to manipulate the phosphinocytide metabolism and to invade cells. So uh, Listeria belongs to a genus of gram-positive bacteria. We find six species, and one of these species, Listeria monocytogenes, has been associated to a, a foodborne human disease known as Listeriosis. So Listeria is able, as uh, Shigella, to enter uh, whole cells. It can escape from its internalization vacuole in order to proliferate in the cytoplasm. And in the lab, we have been interested in, for several years in the process of bacterial entry into target cells, which is a very dynamic process and which has teach us many things concerning uh, novel signaling cascades in the cell. So there are two main uh, cellular proteins, which are bacterial proteins, sorry, which are required for entry. INLA interacts with its receptor E cadherin and uh, involves bacterial entry into polarized epithelial cells. Today, I will speak to you mainly about a, a different pathway, which involves another member of the internalin family, INLB. INLB is an extended molecule which is characterized by the presence of leucine which repeats in its N terminal domain and it's a module involving protein protein interaction and the protein presents some GW domains in its C terminal domain which are involved in the interaction of this protein with the bacterial cell wall. However, this interaction is not covalent and the protein can be released from the bacterial cell wall so we can find soluble INLB interacting with cells. And we have shown in the past that INLB can interact through its GW domain with gly glycosaminoglycans of the extracellular matrix. However, the main signaling receptor for MET is MET, which is the hepatocyte growth factor receptor. And we have shown also that uh, actually INLB mimics many of the signaling pathways which are activated by the natural ligand of MET, which is the HEF. So for example, upon interaction with INLB, MET, which is a tyrosine kinase receptor, becomes phosphorylated and can trigger the recruitment of several adapter proteins. One of these molecules is CIVIL, which is an ubiquitin ligase, which can induce the ubiquitination of MET and its internalization by endocytosis. And precisely, Esteban Vega in the lab had shown that Listeria uses the endocytic machinery in order to invade cells. And for example, part of this machinery includes the clattering coat and also a dynamine. And all these molecules are precisely rearranged at the site of bacterial entry in order to promote uh, efficient internalization. Civil is not the only molecule which is recruited by MET. There are several adapters, including GAB1 and Chic, and they are involved in the recruitment of an important lipid kinase the type 1 PI3 kinase, which is involved in the formation of PIP3 at the site of bacterial entry. Stephanie Sevo in the lab has also, had shown also that the reorganization of PIP3 in cholesterol in rich rafts is very important for the signaling cascade downstream of the PI3 kinase. And actually, she has been able to show by threat that in cholesterol depleted cells, we cannot detect the recruitment of the plasma membrane of molecules which recognize PIP3, even if this molecule is produced at the site of MET activation. So PIP3 is involved in the recruitment of RAC, and Ellen Bierne in lab has shown that RAC is located upstream of WAVE of the ARP23 complex and of the actin polymerization reorganization which is required for bacterial entry. Most recently, Serge Mostowi in the lab has shown that another uh, cytoskeletal element, which are the molecules which belong to the septin family, are also required for bacterial entry. And Serge has been able to show that uh, septins interact with actin, forming rings at the site of bacterial entry. He has shown also that septins are, in particular, septin 2 is required for the proper 
functioning of the PA3 kinase, indicating that septins can play different roles at the site of entry of listeria. So in this scenario, it's clear that the PA3 kinase and the PIP3 play a very important role, a very central role in the organization of a cytoskeleton rearrangement. However, we know that PIP3 is just one of several phosphinocytides which are produced in the cell and which can regulate different cytoskeletal rearrangements or membrane trafficking events. So in this scenario, we wanted to investigate if Listeria was able to manipulate other lipid kinases beside the PI3 kinase in order to induce invasion. So to answer to this question, we took advantage of a system that is very well known in the lab, a simplified system, which includes the coating of latex beads with a specific Listeria protein, in this case, INLB, which leads to the efficient internalization of these particles inside uh, target cells. So we internalize these beads in a colon epithelial cell line, lobo cells, and uh, after a subcellular fractionation in a sucrose gradient, we were able to purify a fraction of phagosomes containing these beads. So our question was, are there specific lipid kinases present at the surface of these compartments? In order to answer this question, we incubated these phagosomes, we radiolabel ATP, and then we monitor by thin layer chromatography the production of a radiolabel phosphinocytides. And this work let us demonstrate that actually there is a family of type 2 PR4 kinases which are present in this compartment and which are required for bacterial invasion. So indeed, we were able to show that at the surface of this compartment there is an important production of PIP and by HPLC, we were able to show that this uh, fraction corresponds to a phosphinocytide known as, as PI4P. So PI4P is a signaling molecule which can be produced by several pathways in the cell, but the most straightforward pathway is the phosphorylation of PI by a PI4 kinase. So we decided to investigate if PI4 kinases are present at the surface of the INLB phagosomes. We know that there are uh, two main families of PI4 kinases. The type 3 family is very, very closely related to the type uh, 1 PI3 kinase family, and these uh, kinases can be inhibited by wormanin. There is another family, the type 2 PI4 kinases family, which can be inhibited by adenosine, and their activity can be slightly increased by Triton X100. So we incubated our phagosomes containing the INLB beads in the presence of this compartment, of this compound, sorry, and we measured the production of PI4P. And in this essay, we were able to show that actually only adenosine blocks the production of PI4P, which is a signature of type 2 PI4 kinases, indicating or suggesting that a type 2 PI4 kinases is present at the surface of these compartments. So what do we know about this family of kinases? We know that there are two main isoforms in the cell, an alpha isoform, which is membrane associated and which has been mainly localized to the Golgi, and another isoform, the beta isoform, which is uh, more cytoplasmic. So, as we are here today uh, with the concept of seeing is believing, we want to see what was going on on cells with, uh, when we were internalizing these beads. And uh, we were able to observe that the, the PA4 kinase alpha actually is rapidly recruited at the site of entry of these beads. And actually, in this assay, we didn't, we didn't permeabilize the cells. So in this case, the beads which are more labeled are more extracellular, and the beads which are weakly labeled are in the process of being internalized. And we can observe that some beads in which the phagocytic cup is not completely closed present the recruitment of the kinase, indicating that this process is, occurs very early during invasion. Of course, we wanted to know what was happening with the bacteria, and with listeria, with wild-type listeria, we were also able to show that the bacteria very early recruit the kinase, since in this essay in which we label the extracellular part of the bacteria with one fluorochrome and the intracellular part with another one, we are able to observe that the part of the bacteria which is inside the cell is already able to trigger the recruitment of the kinase. This recruitment is dependent on the interaction of the bacteria with the receptor met, since only the bacteria which are able to interact with this receptor are able to reorganize the kinase at the site of entry. And by live cell imaging, we wanted to investigate, the, again, the dynamic of this recruitment. We will observe that it's very fast. We will have in here, in red, the recruitment of the type 2 PI4 kinase. And afterwards, 
we are going to have the recruitment of RAP5, which is a marker of early endosomes, indicating that the kinase is recruited indeed during the very early stages of internalization. So of course, we wanted to investigate the contribution of these kinases to the uh, process of entry. We inactivated them by small interferon RNA, and we were able to observe that the inactivation of the PA4 kinase alpha blocks up to 80% of entry of the bacteria into target cells, suggesting that this kinase indeed is required for invasion. Now, which one could be the specific contribution of this molecule to the, to the entry process? As uh, said before, these kinases are involved in the formation of PA4P. However, we know that PA4P can be converted into PI345P3, and as I told you in the introduction, PI345P3 is very important for the reorganization of the actin cytoskeleton during bacterial entry. So we wanted to investigate if these kinases could participate in this signaling cascade, which lead to the formation of PI345P3. And for this, we inactivate the kinases, and then we monitor the recruitment of AKT at the plasma membrane, and mainly its phosphorylation by a kinase, which is dependent on the production of PI345P3. What we could observe is that when we inactivate the kinases, we do not observe a change in the, in the pattern of phosphorylation of AKT suggesting in this case that these enzymes are not involved in this signaling cascade that leads to the formation of PI345P3 and led us to propose a model in which we think that these kinases do not participate in this uh, part of the signaling cascade downstream of MET and we think that they participate in novel uh, process in which they produce PA4P, and PA4P is now known to be a very important signaling molecule on its own uh, as PI345P3, which can bring uh, target molecules to the plasma membrane. So, which could be the downstream effectors of PI4P? We investigate one important effector, which is the uh, clattering adapter AP1. Indeed, AP1 is a molecule which has been shown to interact with PI4P produced by the type 2 PI4 kinase alpha at the Golgi. However, AP1 has been also shown by several groups, including the group of uh, François Letourneur in Lyon and the group of Florence Niedergan in Cochin, that this molecule is required for efficient phagocytosis. Indeed, by a small interferon RNA, we were able to show that inactivation of AP1 blocks the entry of Listeria into target cells to the same level as the, the one that we observe when we inactivate clattering. So we were thinking that AP1 could make a link between the type 2 PA4 kinase and the clattering. However, by electromicroscopy, in collaboration with Martin Sachs at the Pasteur Institute, we were not able to detect the recruitment of AP1 at the phagocytic cup. And by live cell imaging, we were able to detect, detect the reorganization of AP1 positive vesicles at the vicinity of the Listeria entry site, but we were not able to detect a clear recruitment as the one that we observed with clattering or with dynamine. So these results lead us to the idea that AP1 indeed is required for bacterial entry, but we cannot uh, determine, conclude that AP1 is located downstream of this signaling cascade. So we wanted to investigate also uh, upstream partners of the type 2 PA4 kinases, in particular molecules which could be involved in the recruitment of these kinases to the bacterial entry site. And uh, our attention was drawn to a family of molecules called tetraspanins. Indeed, the group of uh, Rolf Helmer had shown that after immunoprecipitation of different members of this tetraspanin family, he was able to detect uh, the production of PA4P, and this production of PA4P was specifically associated to the type 2 PA4 kinase alpha. And this result actually indicates that the tetraspanins are, uh, are located between the very few molecules which are able to directly interact with the type 2 PA4 kinases. So what are tetraspanins? Tetraspanins are uh, transmembrane molecules characterized by the presence of do, uh, two extracellular loops, and actually they behave as extracellular cross-linkers or as a molecule which can cluster signaling platforms. 
In this cartoon, we observe how CD81, for example, is able to cluster different molecules which are involved in the uh, activation of the B cell receptor. And interestingly, it has been shown that several pathogenic agents, for example, the hepatitis C virus, is able to subvert some tetraspanins, in this case CD81, in order to invade cells. So we wanted to investigate if uh, tetraspanins are involved in the recruitment of the type 2 PI4 kinase to the Listeria entry site, and these results lead us to demonstrate that, that indeed tetraspanins are recruited to the site of Listeria entry, and in particular CD81 is required for this recruitment and is required for bacterial entry. So there are five main tetraspanins which had been associated with a PA4 kinase activity. However, since we are working with HeLa cells, we decided to study the main tetraspanins which are ex expressed in these cells, two plasma membrane molecules, CD9 and CD81, and also a late endosomal uh, molecule, CD63, which is known to transit also by the plasma membrane. So at first, we wanted to investigate the colocalization between tetraspanins and the type 2 PI4 kinase in resting cells, in cells which have, which have not been infected by listeria, and we could observe that CD9 presents a plasma membrane localization, and we can observe the concentration of CD9 at a site of cell to cell addition. In contrast, the PA4 kinase, it's in, in, uh, in its reported uh, intracellular location, which is a perinuclear location, uh, which corresponds to the transgolgi network and also to late endosomal compartments. So, in this case, we observe that we do not find uh, interaction. By, with the tetraspanins and the type 2 PA4 kinase, at least at site of uh, the plasma membrane. In the case of CD63, on the contrary, we observe a very good colocalization with the PA4 kinase alpha and CD63, which uh, agrees with the literature, suggesting that PA4 kinase can regulate late endosomal rearrangement, and CD63 has been shown to be an important late endosomal marker. In the case of CD81, we observed a partial colocalization between the kinase and CD81 in this perinuclear location. But again, as in the case of CD9, we observed that at site of cell to cell location, we do not detect the PI4 kinase. So, of course, we wanted to know what was going on in cells which are infected with listeria. And what we were able to observe is that in some cases, we have bacteria which are a recruiting CD9 at the site of bacterial entry, but we do not see colocalization with the kinase, and vice versa. We observe bacteria which are able to interact with the kinase, but which do not seem to interact with uh, the tetraspanin CD9. In the case of CD63, we observe a better colocalization between these two markers, as could have been suggested by the fact that these two molecules are already associated in similar compartments in resting cells. However, we observe that the distribution of these molecules is distinct, and they label uh, different domains of the same internalizing bacteria. Finally, in the case of CD81, as in the case of CD9, we observe that some bacteria are labeled by CD81 but do not localize, localize with the kinase, while in other cases we observe the local, localization with the kinase and not the localization with CD81, indicating that the tetraspanins can be recruited to the site of enteral hysteria, but probably with different dynamics as the one uh, with the uh, tetraspanins. So, of course, we wanted to go to live cell imaging. So, this is the video that I showed you at first, in which we can observe the important recruitment of CD9 at the site of entry of the bacteria. And we wanted to know, of course, what was happening with the type 2 PA4 kinase when we are overexpressing uh, GFP CD9. And in this video, we are going to be able to observe that when we overexpress these molecules, it seems that these two molecules can be located to the same bacterial entry site. However, if we look in detail, we are able to observe that there are structures which are labeled by CD9, which are not precisely labeled by the PA4 kinase, indicating that these molecules can be recruited to the same bacteria at the site of invasion. However, the distribution at the site, at, at the domain where the bacteria is being internalized, is not precisely the same. Similar observation was made with CD63 and the PA4 kinase, in which we observe that there are some vesicles which are perfectly labeled by the two markers, but we have some other vesicles which are labeled by one marker and not by the other 
again suggesting that the interaction with the bacteria and these different molecules occurs with different kinetics. And it was more clear in the case of CD81, in which we can observe first the recruitment of CD81 and just afterwards the recruitment of the PI4 kinase. We are going to observe in here in detail that first we will have the peak of colocalization of CD81 at the cytobacterial entry, and then afterwards we will have the recruitment of the PI4 kinase. So this result leads us to the idea that, uh, as opposed to the results which were observed by Hemmler, these molecules probably can be recruited by the same internalized bacteria, but they do not seem to interact at the precise uh, same uh, domain during bacterial entry. So of course, the idea that we wanted to explore is, are these tetraspanins involved in the recruitment of the PI4 kinase? So for this, we inactivate the different tetraspanins and we studied the distribution of the type 2 PA4 kinase. What we could observe is that when we inactivate the CD9, we do not hamper the recruitment of the type 2 PA4 kinase alpha, suggesting that CD9 is not required for the recruitment of the kinase. We observe a similar scenario with CD63. When we inactivate CD63, we do not block the recruitment of the type 2 PA4 kinase. However, when we block CD81, in bacteria which seem to be in the process of being internalized, we are not able to detect, to detect the recruitment of the kinase, suggesting that CD81 could be involved in the recruitment of this kinase. So we know, as I told you before, that tetraspanins are organizers of the plasma membrane, so we were interested in the, to investigate if CD81 could be also important for the reorganization of MET, the receptor at the bacterial entry site. So again, we inactivated the different uh, tetraspanins and we studied the distribution of MET and of the PI4 kinase alpha. And we observed that when we inactivate this tetraspanin, we are not able to block the recruitment of MET. And as we observed before, we do not block the recruitment of the kinase. Similar scenario, when we block CD63, we do not block the recruitment of MET and of the PI4 kinase. And interestingly, when we block CD81, we still have the recruitment of MET. However, we are not able anymore to detect the recruitment of the type 2 PA4 kinase alpha, which indicates that CD81 is located downstream of MET, but upstream of the type 2 PA4 kinase alpha. And of course, we wanted to know if this inactivation it plays a role during the entry process, so we inactivate the different settings. And as we could have expected from the last result, only inactivation of CD81 blocks the entry of listeria into target cells. So we are able to show that uh, treated traspanins are recruited at the site of listeria entry, CD9, CD63, and CD81. However, only CD81 is involved in the recruitment of the type 2 PI4 kinase alpha. Of course, there are several questions which remain. Uh, is there an, uh, a direct interaction between the tetraspanin and the PA4 kinase, as suggested by the work for, from the group of Hemmler? And in our hands, we, by uh, biochemical analysis or by FRET analysis, we have not been able to show a direct interaction between these molecules. So we think that there are still intermediate molecules which are recruited probably by CD81, which are important in the recruitment of the kinase. And of course, we don't know at this moment why these two other tetraspanins are recruited at the entry site without playing uh, a tangible function during the entry process. What is interesting is the fact that CD81 has been shown to play a function in the entry of other pathogenic agents, such as the hepatitis C virus and plasmodium. And there are common themes between these agents and listeria. All of them interact with glycosaminoglycans at the surface of target cells and they require also cholesterol for the, for the invasion process. So for example, in the case of plasmodium, it has been reported that glycosaminoglycans can stop the movement of the parasite at the surface of hepatocytes, and it has been suggested that cholesterol is involved in the enrichment of CD81, which itself will be involved in the recruitment of the receptor that is still not known, and which will be involved in the internalization of the parasite. In the case of listeria, we know that INLB interacts with uh, glucosaminoglycans, and that after interaction with MET, we have the recruitment of the PA3 kinase, which produce PA345P3, and the organization of PA345P3 is regulated by the presence of cholesterol at the plasma membrane. So 
we are interested in, moment, in this moment in uh, determining if there is a synergy between CD81 and cholesterol in the reorganization of PIP3 at the site of bacterial entry. And of course, we, is, we are still investigating which are the downstream effectors of this signaling cascade. And importantly, as we know now that CD81 is involved in the entry of the hepatitis C virus and plasmodium, and we know that CD81 recruits or it's involved in the recruitment of the type 2 PI4 kinase alpha to the site of Listeria entry, it would be interested to investigate if this family of molecules can also play a role in the entry of these uh, pathogenic agents. So with this, I would like to stop. I would like to thank the team of Pascal Cossart, and in particular, Nam to Tam, who has been involved in the main, mainly the, uh, the main experiments done with the Tetraspanin project. I would like to thank Bernard Peyrastro in Toulouse, which uh, helped us in the early uh, analysis of the phosphinocytide metabolism in whole cells, and uh, Eric Rubinstein and Claude Bouchex at Vildrif, which had been in instrumental for the study of the tetraspanins association to the Listeria entry process. And of course, uh, thank you to the people who give money to the lab, and thanks to you for your attention. Merci, Ravier. Super. Uh, Rafia, uh, what is the uh, uh, relative contribution of the interleukin B system yeah. in infecting tissues in the animal relative to the interleukin A, which is of course involved in crossing epithelia? It, when, once you suppress interleukin A expression, do you still have some marginal entry into epithelia due to this system, or actually, well, this is a very does it only allow to entry into other cell types, or, and do the two systems synergize? Well, this is a very good question, and actually the team of uh, Marc Liqui, which uh, he has a group uh, at saint at Pasteur at this moment, he's precisely studying these issues, and he has been able to show, for example, that for the transversal of the intestinal barrier, even if MET is present on these cells, it seems that only INLA plays an important role. So the traversal of the intestinal barrier is dependent of INLA. However, the invasion of uh, the placenta is dependent both on INLA and INLB. So it seems that depending on the tissue, you will have or not synergy between these two molecules. And at this moment, we don't know precisely the molecular issues, why in some tissues we have the synergy and why in others we don't have the synergy, even if the, the receptors are present. So this is, this is an issue that is being Sorry? Does it allow to invade non-epithelial cells? Non-epithelial, non for example? Well, actually, MET is a very, MET is a very broad, MET, MET is a ubiquitous mo molecule. So we could think that actually Listeria could invade many different cell types. But as I mentioned, for example, in the intestine, even if MET is present, we know that the traversal of the barrier is mainly dependent of INLA. So the, the, the details are still missing at this stage. Other questions? I remember when the tetraspanin are in the immune synapse. Actually, tetraspanins have been shown to play a role in many, many different... Uh, so my question was, is, mm. do you have any idea if Chigel, uh, Listeria wow. oh, okay. is... is use this immune synapse to enter in, in, in presenting cells? No, we, we don't have any clue at this moment. So, so, so do you think there's a, there's a synergy between PIP3 and, and um, PI4P? PI, in the sense that, I mean, if you, for example, when you inactivate PI4P, do you still have REC activation, actin polymerization? Uh, uh, we, it seems that the, the cascade leading to the RAC activation is independent at least of this uh, family of type 2 PI4 kinases because they're actually in the cells we have four different PI4 kinases and the type 3 family in particular the alpha isoform is involved in this, uh, this signaling that leads to the PI3 kinase signaling. However, the type 2 PA4 kinase, and particularly the alpha isoform, is not involved in this RAC activation, so it's completely independent pathway. Thank you. 